The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious An Essay by Carl Jung Part 1 The Effects of the Unconscious Upon Consciousness 1. The Personal and the Collective Unconscious In Freud's view, as most people know, the contents of the unconscious are reducible to infantile tendencies, which are repressed because of their incompatible character. Repression is a process that begins in early childhood under the moral influence of the environment and continues throughout life. By means of analysis, the repressions are removed and the repressed wishes made conscious. According to this theory, the unconscious contains only those parts of the personality which could just as well be conscious and have been suppressed only through the process of education. Although, from one point of view, the infantile tendencies of the unconscious are the most conspicuous, it would nonetheless be a mistake to define or evaluate the unconscious entirely in these terms. The unconscious has still another side to it. It includes not only repressed contents, but all psychic material that lies below the threshold of consciousness. It is impossible to explain the subliminal nature of all this material on the principle of repression, for in that case the removal of repression ought to endow, endow a person with a prodigious memory which would thenceforth forget nothing. We therefore emphatically affirm that in addition to the repressed material, the unconscious contains all those psychic components that have fallen below the threshold, as well as subliminal sense perceptions. Moreover, we know from abundant experience, as well as for theoretical reasons, that the unconscious also contains all the material that has not yet reached the threshold of consciousness. These are the seeds of future conscious contents. Equally, we have reason to suppose that the unconscious is never quiescent in the sense of being inactive, but is ceaselessly engaged in grouping and regrouping its contents. This activity should be thought of as completely autonomous only in pathological cases. Normally, it is coordinated with the conscious mind in a compensatory relationship. It is to be assumed that all these contents are of a personal nature insofar as they are acquired during the individual's life. Since this life is limited, the number of acquired contents in the unconscious must also be limited. This being so, it might be thought possible to empty the unconscious either by analysis or by making a complete inventory of the unconscious contents, on the ground that the unconscious cannot produce anything more than what is already known and assimilated into consciousness. We should also have to suppose, as already said, that if one could arrest the descent of conscious contents into the unconscious by doing away with repression, unconscious productivity would be paralyzed. This is possible only to a very limited extent, as we know from experience. We urge our patients to hold fast to repressed contents that have been reassociated with consciousness and to assimilate them into their plan of life. But this procedure, as we may daily convince ourselves, makes no impression on the unconscious since it calmly goes on producing dreams and fantasies which, according to Freud's original theory, must arise from personal repressions. If in such cases we pursue our observations systematically and without prejudice, we shall find material which, although similar in form to the previous personal contents, yet seems to contain illusions that go far beyond the personal sphere. Casting about in my mind for an example to illustrate what I have just said, I have a particularly vivid memory of a woman patient with a mild hysterical neurosis, which, as we expressed it in those days, about 1910, 
had its principal cause in a father complex. By this, we wanted to denote the fact that the patient's peculiar relationship to her father stood in her way. She had once been... She has been on very good terms with her father, who has since died. It was a relationship chiefly of feeling. In such cases, it is usually the intellectual function that is developed, and this later becomes the bridge to the world. Accordingly, our patient became a student of philosophy. Her energetic pursuit of knowledge was, pers was motivated by her need to extricate herself from the emotional entanglement with her father. This operation may succeed if her feelings can find an outlet on the new intellectual level, perhaps in the formation of an emotional tie with a suitable man, equivalent to the former tie. In this particular case, however, the transition refused to take place because the patient's feelings remained suspended, oscillating between her father and a man who was not altogether suitable. The progress of her life was thus held up, and that inner disunity, so characteristic of a neurosis, promptly made its appearance. The so-called normal person would probably be able to break the emotional bond in one or the other direction by a powerful act of will. And this is perhaps the more usual thing. He would come through the difficulty unconsciously on the smooth path of instinct, without ever being aware of the sort of conflict that lay behind his headaches or other physical discomforts. By any weakness of instinct, which may have many causes, is enough to hinder a smooth, unconscious transition. Then all progress is delayed by conflict, and the resulting stasis of life is equivalent to a neurosis. In consequence of the standstill, psychic energy flows off in every conceivable direction, apparently quite use uselessly. For instance, there are excessive innervations of the sympathetic system, which lead to nervous disorders of the stomach and intestines, or the vagus, and consequently the heart, is stimulated, or fantasies and memories uninteresting enough in themselves become overvalued and prey on the conscious mind, mountains out of molehills. In this state, a new motive is needed to put an end to the morbid sus suspension. Nature herself paves the way for this, unconsciously and indirectly, through the phenomenon of the transference. Freud. In the course of treatment, the patient transfers the father imago to the doctor, thus making him, in a sense, the father, and in the sense that he is not the father, also making him a substitute for the man she cannot reach. The, th the doctor therefore becomes a father and a kind of lover, in other words, an object of conflict. In him the opposites are united, and for this reason he stands for a quasi-ideal solution of the conflict. Without in the least wishing it, he draws upon himself an overvaluation that is almost incredible to the outsider, for to the patient he seems like a savior or a god. This way of speaking is not altogether so laughable as it sounds. It is indeed a bit much to be a father and lover at once. Nobody could possibly stand up to it in the long run, precisely because it is too much of a good thing. One would have to be a demigod, or at least to sustain such a role without a break, for all the time one would have to be the giver. To the patient in the state of transference, this provisional solution naturally seems ideal, but only at first. In the end, she comes to a standstill that is just as bad as, a, as the neurotic conflict was. Fundamentally, Nothing has yet happened that might lead to a real solution. The conflict has merely been transferred. Nevertheless, a successful transference can, at least temporarily, cause the whole neurosis to disappear. And for this reason, it has been very rightly recognized by Freud as a healing factor of first-rate importance. 
but at the same time as a provisional state only, for although it holds out the possibility of a cure, it is far from being the cure itself. The somewhat lengthy discussion seemed to me essential if my example was to be understood, for my patient had arrived at the state of transference and had already reached the upper limit where the standstill begins to make itself disagreeable. The question now arose, what next? I had, of course, become the complete savior, and the thought of having to give me up was not only exceedingly distasteful to the patient, but positively terrifying. In such a situation, sound common sense generally comes out with a whole repertory of admonitions. You simply must. You really ought. You just cannot, etc. So far as sound common sense is, happily, not too rare and not entirely without effect, pessimists I know exist, a rational motive can, in the exuberant feeling of buoyancy you get from the transference, release so much enthusiasm that a painful sacrifice can be risked with a mighty effort of will. If successful, and these things sometimes are, the sacrifice bears blessed fruit, and the erstwhile patient leaps at one bound into the state of being practically curd. The doctor is generally so delighted that he fails to tackle the theoretical difficulties connected with this little miracle. If the leap does not succeed, and it does not succeed with my patient, and it did not succeed with my patient, one is then faced with the problem of resolving the transference. Here, psychoanalytic theory shrouds itself in a thick darkness. Apparently, we are to fall back on some nebulous trust in fate. Somehow or other, the matter will settle itself. The transference stops automatically when the patient runs out of money, as a slightly cynical colleague once remarked to me. Or the ineluctable demands of life make it impossible for the patient to linger on in the transference demands which compel the involuntary sacrifice sometimes with a more or less complete relapse as a result one may look in vain for accounts of such cases in the books that sing the praises of psychoanalysis to be sure there are hopeless cases where nothing helps but there are also cases that do not get stuck and do not inevitably leave the transference situation with bitter hearts and sore heads. I told myself, at this juncture with my patient, that there must be a clear and respectable way out of the impasse. My patient had long since run out of money, if indeed she ever possessed any, but I was curious to know what means nature would devise for a satisfactory way out of the transference deadlock since I never imagined what I was blessed with, that sound common sense which always knows exactly what to do in every quandary, and since my patient knew as little as I, I suggested to her that we could at least keep an eye open for any movements coming from a sphere of the psyche uncontaminated by our superior wisdom and our conscious plannings. That meant, first and foremost, her dreams." Dreams contain images and thought associations, which we do not create with conscious intent. They arise spontaneously without our assistance and are representatives of a psychic activity withdrawn from our arbitrary will. Therefore, the dream is, pr properly speaking, a highly objective, natural product of the psyche, from which we might expect indications, or at least hints, about certain basic trends in the psychic process. Now, since the psychic process, like any other life process, is not just a causal sequence, but is also a process with a teleological orientation, we might expect dreams to give us certain indicia about the objective causality, as well as about the objective tendencies precisely because dreams are nothing less than self-representations of the psychic life process. On the basis of these reflections, then, we subjected the dreams to a careful examination. It would lead 
too far to quote word for word all the dreams that now followed. Let it suffice to sketch their main character. The majority referred to the person of the doctor. That is to say, the actors were unmistakably the dreamer herself and her doctor. The latter, however, seldom appeared in his natural shape, but was generally distorted in a remarkable way. Sometimes his figure was of supernatural size, sometimes he seemed to be extremely aged. Then again he resembled her father, but was at the same time curiously woven into nature, as in the following dream. Her father, who in reality was of small stature, was standing with her on a hill that was covered with wheat fields. She was quite tiny beside him, and he seemed to her like a giant. He lifted her up from the ground and held her in his arms like a little child. The wind swept over the wheat fields, and as the wheat swayed in the wind, he rocked her in his arms. From this dream and from others like it, I could discern various things. Above all, I got the impression that her unconscious was holding unshakably to the idea of my being the father lover so that the fatal tie we were trying to undo appeared to be doubly strengthened. Moreover, one could hardly avoid seeing that the unconscious placed a special emphasis on the supernatural, almost divine, divine nature of the father-lover, thus accentuating still further the overvaluation occasioned by the transference. I therefore asked myself whether the patient had not... not still not understood the wholly fantastic character of her transference, or whether perhaps the unconscious could never be reached by understanding at all, but must blindly and ideal, idiotically, idiotically pursue some nonsense chimera. Freud's idea that the unconscious can do nothing but wish, Schopenhauer's blind and aimless will, the Gnostic demiurge, who in his vanity seems himself perfect, and then in the blindness of his limitation creates something lamentably imperfect, all these pessimistic suspicions of an essentially negative background to the world and the soul come threateningly near. And there would indeed be nothing to set against this except a well-meaning you ought, reinforced by a stroke of the axe, that would cut down the whole phantasmagoria for good and all. But as I turned the dreams over and over in my mind, there dawned on me another possibility. I said to myself, it cannot be denied that the dreams continue to speak in the same old metaphors with which our conversations have made the patient as well as myself sickeningly familiar. But the patient has an undoubted understanding of her transference fantasy. She knows that I appear to her as a semi-define father-lover, and she can, at least intellectually, distinguish this from my factual reality. Therefore, the dreams are obviously reiterating the conscious standpoint, minus the conscious criticism, which they completely ignore. They reiterate the conscious contents, not in toto, but in, in insist on the fantastic standpoint as opposed to sound common sense. I naturally asked myself, what was the source of this obstinacy and what was its purpose? That it must have some purposive meaning, I was convinced, for there is no truly living thing that does not have a final meaning that can, in other words, be explained as a mere leftover from antecedent facts. But the energy of the transference is so strong that it gives one the impression of a vital instinct. That being so, what is the purpose of such fantasies? A careful examination and analysis of the dreams, especially of the one just quoted, revealed a very marked tendency, in contrast to conscious criticism, which always seeks to reduce things to human proportions, to endow the person of the doctor with superhuman attributes. He has to be gigantic, primordial, huger than the father, like the wind that sweeps over the earth. Was he then to be made into a god? Or, I said to myself, 
Was it rather the case that the unconscious was trying to create a god out of the person of the doctor, as it were to free a vision of God from the veils of the personal, so that the transference to the person of the doctor was no more than a misunderstanding on the part of the conscious mind, a stupid trick played by sound common sense? Was the urge of the unconscious perhaps only apparently reaching out towards the person, but in a deeper sense towards a god? Could the longing for a god be a passion welled up from our darkest, instinctual nature, a passion unswayed by any outside influences, deeper and stronger perhaps than the love for a human person? Or was it perhaps the highest and truest meaning of that inappropriate love we call transference, a little bit of real gotesmine that has been lost to consciousness ever since the 15th century? No one will doubt the reality of a passionate longing for a human person, but that a fragment of religious psychology, an historical anachronism, indeed something of a medieval curiosity, we are reminded of Mechtild of Magdeburg, should come to light as an immediate living reality in the middle of the consulting room and be expressed in the prosaic figure of the doctor seems almost too fantastic to be taken seriously. A genuinely scientific attitude must be unprejudiced. The sole criterion for the validity of a hypothesis is whether or not it possesses an heuristic, i.e. explanatory, value. The question now is, can we regard the possibilities set forth above as a valid hypothesis? There is no a priori reason why it should not be just as possible that the unconscious tendencies have a goal beyond the human person so that the unconscious can do nothing but wish. Experience alone can decide which is the more suitable hypothesis. This new hypothesis was not entirely plausible to my very critical patient. The earlier view that I was the father lover, and as such presented an ideal solution of the conflict, was incomparably more attractive to her way of feeling. Nevertheless, her intellect was sufficiently keen to appreciate the theoretical possibility of the new hypothesis. Meanwhile, the dreams continued to disintegrate the person of the doctor and swell him to ever vaster proportions. Concurrently with this, there now occurred something which at first I alone perceived, with the utmost astonishment, namely a kind of subterranean undermining of the transference. Her relations with a certain friend deepened perceptibly, notwithstanding the fact that consciously she still clung to the transference, so that when the time came for leaving me, it was no catastrophe, but a perfectly reasonable parting. I had the privilege of being the only witness during the process of severance. I saw how the transpersonal control point developed. I cannot call it anything else. A guiding function, and step by step, gathered to itself all the formal, former personal over-evaluations. How, with this afflux of energy, it gained influence over the resisting conscious mind without the patient's consciously noticing what was happening. From this, I realized that the dreams were not just fantasies, but self-representations of unconscious developments, which allowed the psyche of the patient gradually to grow out of the pointless personal tie. This change took place, as I showed, through the unconscious development of a transpersonal control point, a virtual goal, as it were, that expressed itself symbolically symbolically, in a form which can only be described as a vision of God. The dreams swelled the human person of the doctor to the superhuman proportions, making him a gigantic primordial father, who is at the same time the wind, and in whose protecting arms the dreamer rests like an infant. <clears throat> if we try to make the patients conscious and traditionally Christian, 
idea of God responsible for the divine image in the dreams, we would still have to lay stress on the distortion. In religious matters, the patient had a critical and agnostic attitude, and her idea of a possible deity had long since passed into the realm of the inconceivable, i.e. had dwindled into a complete abstraction. In contrast to this, the god image of the dreams corresponded to the archaic conception of a nature demon, something like Wotan. God as spirit is here translated back into its original form, where, there are Greek letters, means wind. God is the wind, stronger and mightier than man, an invisible breath spirit. As in Hebrew, ruah, so in Arabic, ru, means breath and spirit. Out of the purely personal form, the dreams develop an archaic God image that is infinitely far from the conscious idea of God. It might be objected that this is simply an infantile image, a childhood memory. I would have no quarrel with this assumption if we were dealing with an old man sitting on a golden throne in heaven, but there is no trace of any sentimentality of that kind. Instead, we have a primordial idea that we can that can correspond only to an archaic mentality. These primordial ideas, of which I have given a great many examples in my Symbols of Transformation, oblige one to make in regard to unconscious material, a distinction of quite a different character from that between pre-conscious and unconscious or subconscious and unconscious. The justification for these distinctions need not be discussed here. They have their specific view and are worth elaborating further as points of view. The fundamental distinction which experience has forced upon me claims to be no more than that. It should be evident from the foregoing that we have to distinguish in the unconscious a layer which we may call the personal unconscious. The materials contained in this layer are of a personal nature insofar as they have the character partly of acquisitions derived from the individual's life and partly of psychological factors which could just as well be conscious. It can readily be understood that incompatible psycho psychological elements are liable to repression and therefore become unconscious. But on the other hand, this implies the possibility of making and keeping the repressed contents conscious once they have been recognized. We recognize them as personal contents because their effects or their partial manifestation or their source can be discovered in our personal past. They are the integral components of the personality. They belong to its inventory, and their loss to consciousness produces an inferiority in one respect or another, an inferiority, moreover, that has the psychological character, not so much of an organic lesion or an inborn <coughs> defect, as of a lack which gives rise to a feeling of moral resentment. The sense of moral inferiority always indicates that the missing element is something which, to judge by this feeling about it, really ought not to be missing, or which could be made conscious if only one took sufficient trouble. The moral inferiority does not come from a collision with the generally accepted and, in a sense, arbitrary moral law, but from the conflict with one's own self, which, for reasons of psychic equilibrium, demands that the deficient deficit be redressed. Whenever a sense of moral inferiority appears, it indicates not only a need to assimilate an unconscious comp component, but also the possibility of such assimilation. In the last resort, it is a man's moral qualities which force him, either through direct recognition of the need or indirectly through a painful neurosis, to assimilate his unconscious self and to keep himself fully conscious. Whoever progresses along this road of self-realization must inevitably bring into consciousness the contents of the personal unconscious, thus enlarging the scope of his personality. 
I should add at once that this enlargement has to do primarily with one's moral consciousness, one's knowledge of oneself, for the unconscious contents that are released and brought into consciousness by analysis are usually unpleasant, which is precisely why these wishes, memories, tendencies, plans, etc. were repressed. These are the contents which are brought to light in much the same way by a thorough confession, though to a much more limited extent. The rest comes out as a rule in dream analysis. It is often very interesting to watch how the dreams fetch up the essential points, bit by bit and with the nicest choice. The total material that is added to consciousness causes a considerable widening of the horizon, a deepened self-knowledge which, more than anything else, one would think is calculated to humanize a man and make him modest. But even self-knowledge, assumed by all wise men to be the best and most efficacious, has different effects on different characters. We make very remarkable discoveries in this respect in practical analysis, but I shall deal with this question in the next chapter. As an example of the archaic idea of God shows, the unconscious seems to contain other things besides personal acquisitions and belongings. My patient was quite unconscious of the derivative of spirit from wind, or of the parallelism between the two. This content was not the product of her thinking, nor had she ever been taught it. The critical passage in the New Testament was inaccessible to her. And there's some Greek. Since she knew no Greek, if we must take it as a wholly personal acquisition, it might be a case of so-called cryptomnesia, the unconscious re recollection of a thought which the dreamer had once read somewhere. I have nothing against such a p possibility in this particular case, but I have seen a sufficient number of other cases, many of them are to be found in the book mentioned above, where cryptomnesia can be excluded with certainty. Even if it were a case of cryptomnesia, which seems to me very improbable, we should still have to explain what the predisposition was that caused just this image to be retained and later, as Simon puts it, ecforated, in the Latin, effere, to produce. In any case, cryptomnesia, or no cryptomnesia, we are dealing with a genuine and thoroughly primitive god image that grew up in the unconscious of a civilized person and produced a living effect, an effect which might well give the psychologist of religion food for reflection. There is nothing about this image that could be called personal. It is a wholly collective image, the ethnic origin of which has long been known to us. Here is an, an historical image of worldwide distribution that has come into existence again through a natural psychic function. This is not so very surprising, since my patient was born into the world with a human brain, which presumably still functions today much as it did of old. We are dealing with a reactivated archetype, as I have elsewhere called these primordial images. These ancient images are restored to life by the primitive, analogical, mode of thinking peculiar to dreams. It is not a question of inherited ideas, but of inherited thought patterns. In fact, of, in view of these facts, we must assume that the unconscious contains not only personal, but also impersonal, collective components in the form of inherited categories or archetypes. I have therefore advanced the hypothesis that at its deeper levels, the unconscious possesses collective contents in a relatively active state. This is why I speak of a collective unconscious. 
2. Phenomena resulting from the assimilation of the unconscious. The process of assimilating the unconscious leads to some very remarkable phenomena. It produces in some patients an unmistakable and often unpleasant increase of self-confidence and conceit. They are full of themselves. They know everything. They imagine themselves to be fully informed of everything concerning their unconscious and are persuaded that they understand perfectly everything that comes out of it. At every interview with the doctor, they get more and more above themselves. Others, on the contrary, feel themselves more and more crushed under the contents of the unconscious. They lose their self-confidence and abandon themselves with dull resignation to all the extraordinary things that the unconscious produces. The former, overflowing with feelings of their own importance, assume a responsibility for the unconscious that goes much too far, beyond all reasonable bounds, and the others finally give up all sense of responsibility, overcome by a sense of the powerlessness of the ego against the fate working through the unconscious. If we analyze these two modes of reaction more deeply, we find that the optimistic self-confidence of the first conceals a profound sense of impotence for which their conscious optimism acts as an unsuccessful compensation, while the pessimistic resignation of the others masks a defiant will to power, far surpassing in cocksureness and the conscious optimism of the first type. With these two modes of reaction, I have sketched only two crude extremes. A finer shading would have been truer to reality. As I have said elsewhere, every analysand starts by unconsciously misusing his newly won knowledge in the interests of his abnormal neurotic attitude unless he is sufficiently freed from his symptoms in the early stages to be able to dispense with further treatment altogether. A very important contributory factor is that in the early stages, everything is still understood on the objective level, i.e., without distinction between imago and object, so that everything is referred directly to the object. Hence, the man for whom other people are the objects of prime importance will conclude from any self-knowledge he may have imbibed at this stage of the analysis. Aha! So that is what other people are like. He will therefore feel it his duty, according to his nature, tolerant or otherwise, to enlighten the world. But the other man, who feels himself to be more the object of his fellows than their subject, will be weighed down by this self-knowledge and become correspondingly depressed. I am naturally leaving out of account these numerous and more superficial natures who experience these problems only by the way. In both cases, the relation to the object is reinforced. In the first case, in an active in the second case, in a reactive state. The collective element is markedly accentuated. The one extends the sphere of his action, the other the sphere of his suffering. Adler has employed the term godlikeness to characterize certain basic features of neurotic power psychology. If I likewise borrow the same term from Faust, I use it here more in the sense of that well-known passage where Mephisto writes, Eritus sicut Deus scientes bonum et malum in the student's album and makes the following aside. Just follow the old advice and my cousin the snake. There'll come a time when your godlikeness will make you quiver and quake. The godlikeness evidently refers to knowledge the knowledge of good and evil. The analysis and conscious realization of unconscious contents engender a certain superior tolerance, thanks to which even relatively indigestible portions of one un one's unconscious characterology can be accepted. This tolerance may look very wise and superior, but often it is no more than a grand gesture that brings all sorts of consequences in its train. Two spheres have been brought up together, which before were kept anxiously apart. 
After considerable resistances have been overcome, the union of opposites is successfully achieved, to, at least to all appearances. The deeper understanding thus gained, the juxtaposition of what was before separated, and hence the apparent overcoming of the moral conflict, give rise to a feeling of superiority that may well be expressed by the term godlikeness. But the same juxtaposition of good and evil can have a very different effect on a different kind of temperament. Not everyone will fear, feel himself a superman, holding in his hands the scales of good and evil. It may also seem as though he were a helpless object caught between hammer and anvil, not in the least a Hercules at the parting of the ways, but rather a rudderless ship buffeted between Skyla and Cheribidis. For without knowing it, he is caught up in perhaps the greatest and most ancient of human conflicts, experiencing the throes of eternal principles in collision. Well might he feel himself like a Prometheus, chained to the Caucasus, or as one crucified. This would be a godlikeness in suffering. Godlikeness is certainly not a scientific concept, although it aptly characterizes the psychological state in question. Nor do I imagine that every reader will immediately grasp the peculiar state of mind implied by godlikeness. The term belongs to exclusively to the sphere of belles lettres. So I should probably be better advised to give a more circumspect description of this state. The insight and understanding, then, gained by the analysand, usually reveal much to him that was before unconscious. He naturally applies this knowledge to his environment. In consequences, he sees, or thinks he sees, many things that before were invisible. Since his knowledge was helpful to him, he readily assumes that it would be useful also to others. In this way, he is liable to become arrogant. It may be well meant, but it is nonetheless annoying to other people. He feels as though he possesses a key that opens many, perhaps even all, doors. Psychoanalysis itself has the same bland unconsciousness of its limitations, as can clearly be seen from the way it meddles with works of art. Since human nature is not compounded wholly of light, but also abounds in shadows, the insight gained in practical analysis is often somewhat painful, the more so if, as is generally the case, one has previously neglected the other side. Hence there are people who take their newly won insight very much to heart, far too much in fact, quite forgetting that they are not unique in having a shadow side. They allow themselves to get unduly depressed and are then inclined to doubt everything, finding nothing right anywhere. This is why many excellent analysts with very good ideas can never bring themselves to publish them, because the psychic problem, as they see it, is so overwhelmingly vast that it seems to them almost impossible to tackle it scientifically. One man's optimism makes him overweening, while another's pessimism makes him over-anxious and despondent. Such are the forms which the great conflict takes when reduced to a smaller scale. But even in these less proportions, the essence of the conflict is easily recognized. The arrogance of the one and the despondency of the other share a common uncertainty as to their boundaries. The one is excessively expanded, the other excessively contracted. Their individual boundaries are in some way obliterated. If we now consider the fact that, as a result of psychic compensation, great humility stands very close to pride, and that pride goeth before a fall, we can easily discover behind the haughtiness certain traits of an anxious sense of inferiority. In fact, we shall, shall clearly we see clearly how his uncertainty forces the enthusiast to puff up his truths, of which he feels none too sure, and to win proselytizes to his side in order that his followers may prove to himself the value and trustworthiness of his own convictions. Nor is he altogether so happy in his fund of knowledge as to be able to hold out alone, 
At bottom, he feels isolated by it, and the secret fear of being left alone with it induces him to trot out his opinions and interpretations in and out of season, because only when convincing someone else does he feel safe from gnawing doubts. It is just the reverse with our despondent friend. The more he withdraws and hides himself, the greater becomes his secret need to be understood and recognized. Although he speaks of his inferiority, he does not really believe it. There arises with him a defiant conviction of his unrecognized merits, and in consequence he is sensitive to the slightest disapprobation, always wearing the stricken air of one who is misunderstood and deprived of his rightful due. In this way he nurses a morbid pride and an insolent discontent, which is the very last thing he wants and for which his environment has to pay all the more dearly. Both are at once too small and too big. Their individual mean, never very secure, now becomes shakier than ever. It sounds almost grotesque to describe such a state as godlike, but since each in his way steps beyond his human proportions, both of them are a little superhuman, and therefore, figuratively speaking, godlike. If we wish to avoid the use of this metaphor, I would suggest that we speak instead of psychic infla inflation. The term seems to me appropriate insofar as the state we are discussing involves an extension of the personality beyond individual limits, in other words, a state of being puffed up. In such a state, a man fills a space which normally he cannot fill. He can only fill it by appropriating to himself contents and qualities which properly exist for themselves alone and should therefore remain outside our bounds. What lies outside ourselves belongs either to someone else, or to everyone, or to no one. Since psychic inflation is by no means a phenomenon induced exclusively by analysis, but incurs, occurs just as often in ordinary life, we can investigate it equally well in other cases. A very common instance is the humorless way in which many men identify themselves with their business or their titles. The office I hold is certainly my special activity, but it is also a collective factor that has come into existence historically through the cooperation of many people and whose dignity rests solely on collective approval. When, therefore, I identify myself with my office or title, I behave as though I myself were the whole complex of social factors of which that office consists or as though I were not only the bearer of the office, but also, and at the same time, the approval of society. I have made an extraordinary extension of myself, and have usurped qualities which are not in me, but outside me. Le etat se est moi is the motto for such people. In the case of inflation, through knowledge, we are dealing with something similar in principle, though psychologically more subtle. Hence, it is not the dignity of an office that causes the inflation, but very significant fantasies. I will explain what I mean by practical example, choosing a mental case whom I happened to know personally, and who is also mentioned in a publication by Mader. The case is characterized by a high degree of inflation. In mental cases, we can observe all the phenomena that are present only fleetingly in normal people, in a cruder and enlarged form. The patient suffered from a paranoid dementia with megalomania. He was in telephonic communication with the Mother of God and other great ones. In human reality, he was a wretched locksmith's apprentice who at the age of 19 had become incurably insane. He had never been blessed with intelligence, but he had, among other things, hit upon the magnificent idea that the world was his pit picture book, the pages of which he could turn at will. The proof was quite simple. He had only to turn around, and there was a new page for him to see. This is Schopenhauer's World as Will and Idea, in unadorned, primitive concreteness of vision, a shattering idea indeed, born of extreme alienation and seclusion from the world, 
but so naively and simply expressed that at first one can only smile at the grotesqueness of it. And yet, this primitive way of looking lies at the very heart of Schopenhauer's brilliant vision of the world. Only a genius or a madman could so disentangle himself from the bonds of reality as to see the world as his picture book. Did the patient actually work out or build up such a vision, or did it just befall him? Or did he perhaps fall into it? His pathological disintegration and inflation points rather to the latter. It is no longer he that thinks and speaks, but it thinks and speaks within him. He hears voices. So the difference between him and Schopenhauer is that in him, the vision remained at the stage of a mere spontaneous growth, while Schopenhauer abstracted it and expressed it in a language of universal validity. In doing so, he raised it out of his subterranean beginnings into the clear light of collective consciousness. But it would be quite wrong to suppose that the patient's vision had a purely personal character or value, as though it were something that belonged to him. If that were so, he would be a philosopher. A man is a philosopher of genius only when he succeeds in transmuting the primitive and merely natural vision into an abstract idea belonging to the common stock of consciousness. This achievement and this alone constitutes his personal value, for which he may take credit without necessarily succumbing to inflation. But the sick man's vision is an impersonal value, a natural growth against which he is powerless to defend himself, by which he is actually swallowed up and wafted clean out of the world. Far from his mastering the idea and expanding it, into a philosophical view of the world, it is truer to say that the undoubted grandeur of his vision blew him up to pathological proportions. The personal value lies entirely in the philosophical achievement, not in the primary vision. To the philosopher as well, this vision comes as so much increment, and is simply a part of the common property of mankind, in which, in principle, everyone has a share. The golden apple drop from the same tree, whether they be gathered by an imbecile locksmith's apprentice or by Schopenhauer. There is, however, yet another thing to be learnt from this example, namely that these transpersonal contents are not just inert or dead matter that can be annexed at will. Rather, they are living entities which exert an attractive force upon the conscious mind. Identification with one's office or one's title is very attractive indeed, which is precisely why so many men are nothing more than the decorum accorded to them by society. In vain, one would look for a personality behind the husk. Underneath all the padding, one would find a very pitiable little creature. That is why the office, whatever this outer husk may be, is so attractive. It offers easy compensation for personal deficiencies. Outer attractions, such as offices, titles, and other social regalia, are not the only things that cause inflation. These are simply impersonal quantities that lie outside in society, in the collective consciousness. But just as there is a society outside the individual, so there is a collective psyche outside the personal psyche, namely the collective unconscious concealing, as the above example shows, elements that are no whit less attractive. And there, just as a man may suddenly step into the world on his professional dignity, messieurs à présent séjour roi, so another may disappear out of it equally suddenly when it is his lot to behold of these mighty images put a new face upon the world. There are the magical representations collectives, which underlie the slogan, the catchword, and, on a higher level, the language of the poet and mystic. I am reminded of another mental case, who was neither a poet nor anything very outstanding, just a naturally quiet and rather sentimental youth. He had fallen in love with a girl, and as so often happens, had failed to ascertain whether his love was requited. His primitive participation mystique took it for granted that his agitations were plainly the agitations of the other, which on the lower levels of human psychology 
is naturally very often the case. Thus, he built up a sentimental love fantasy, which precipitately collapsed when he discovered that the girl would have none of him. He was so desperate that he went straight to the river to drown himself. It was late at night, and the stars gleamed up at him from the dark water. It seemed to him that the stars were swimming two by two down the river, and a wonderful feeling came over him. He forgot his suicidal intentions and gazed fascinated at the strange street, sweet drama. And gradually he became aware that every star was a face and all these pairs were lovers who were carried al along, locked in a dreaming embrace. An entirely new understanding came to him. All had changed. His fate, his disappointment, even his love receded and fell away. The memory of the girl grew distant, blurred, but instead he felt with complete certainty that untold riches were promised to him. He knew that an immense treasure lay hidden for him in the neighboring observatory. The result was that he was arrested by the police at four o'clock in the morning, attempting to break into the observatory. What had happened? His poor head had glimpsed a Dante-esque vision whose love Liness he could never have grasped had he read it in a, pro in a poem, but he saw it, and it had transformed him. What had hurt him most was now far away, a new and undreamed of world of stars, tracing their sil silent courses far beyond this grievous earth, had opened out to him the moment he crossed Proserpine's threshold. The intuition of untold wealth and could any fail to be touched by this thought, came to him like a revelation. For his poor turnip head, it was too much. He did not drown in the river, but in an eternal image, and its beauty perished with him. Just as one man may disappear in his social role, so another may be engulfed in an inner vision and be lost to his surroundings. Many fathomless transformations of personality like sudden conversions and other far-reaching changes of mind, originate in the attractive power of a collective image, which, as the present example shows, can cause such a high degree of inflation that the entire personality is disintegrated. This disintegration is a mental disease of a transitory or permanent nature, a splitting of the mind or schizophrenia in Bleuler's term. The pathological inflation naturally depends on some innate weakness of the personality against the autonomy of collective unconscious contents. We shall probably get nearest to the truth if we think of the conscious and personal psyche as resting upon the broad basis of an inherited and universal psychic disposition, which is as such unconscious, and that our personal psyche bears the same relation to the collective psyche as the individual to society. But equally, just as the individual is not merely a unique and separate being, but is also a social being, so the human psyche is not a self-contained and wholly individual phenomenon, but also a collective one. And just as certain social functions or instincts are opposed to the interests of single individuals, so the human psyche exhibits certain functions or tendencies which, on account of their collective nature, are opposed to individual needs. The reason for this is that every man is born with a highly differentiated brain and is thus assured of a wide range of mental functioning which is neither developed ontogenetically nor acquired. But to the degree that human brains are uniformly differentiated, the mental functioning thereby made possible is also collective and universal. This explains, for example, the interesting fact that the unconscious processes of the most widely separated peoples and races shows a quite remarkable correspondence, which displays itself, among other things, in the extraordinary but well-authenticated analogies between the forms and motifs of autochthonous myths, autochthonous myths, the universe, universal similarity of human brains leads to the universal possibility of a uniform mental functioning. This functioning is the collective psyche. 
insomuch as there are differentiations corresponding to race, tribe, and even family. There is also a collective psyche limited to race, tribe, and family over and above the universal collective psyche. To borrow an expression from Pierre Jeannette, the collective psyche comprises the parties inferiores of the psychic functions, that is to say, these deep-rooted, well-nigh automatic portions of the individual psyche which are inherited and are to be found everywhere, and are thus impersonal or suprapersonal. Consciousness plus the personal unconscious constitutes the parties superiors of the psychic functions. These portions, therefore, are that are developed ontogenetically and acquired. Consequently, the individual who annexes the unconscious heritage of the collective psyche to what has accrued to him in the course of his ontogenetic development, as though it were part of the latter, enlarges the scope of his personality in an illegitimate way and suffers the consequences. Insofar as the collective psyche comprises the parties inferiors of the psychic functions, and thus forms the basis of every personality. It has the effect of crushing and devaluing the personality. This shows itself either in the aforementioned stifling of self-confidence, or else in an unconscious heightening of the ego's importance to the power of a pathological will to power. By raising the point, or the personal unconscious to consciousness, the analysis makes the subject aware of things which he is generally aware of in others, but never in himself. This discovery makes him therefore less individually unique and more collective. His collectivization is not always a step to the bad. It may sometimes be a step to the good. There are people who repress their good qualities and consciously give free rein to their infantile desires. The lifting of personal repressions at first brings pers per purely personal contents into consciousness, but attached to them are the collective elements of the unconscious, the ever-present instincts, qualities, and ideas, images, as well as all those st statistical quotas of average virtue and average vice, which we recognize when we say, everyone has in him something of the criminal, the genius, and the saint. Thus, a living picture emerges, containing pretty well everything that moves upon the checkerboard of the world, the good and the bad, the fair and the foul. A sense of solidarity with the world is gradually built up, which is felt by many natures as something very positive and in certain cases actually is the deciding factor in the treatment of neurosis. I have myself seen cases who, in this condition, managed for the first time in their lives to arouse love and even to experience it themselves, or by daring to leap into the unknown, they get involved in the very fate for which they were suited. I have not seen, I have seen not a few who, taking this condition as final, remained for years in a state of enterprising euphoria. I have often heard such cases referred to as shining examples of analytical therapy. But I must point out that these, that cases of this euphoric and enterprising type are so utterly lacking in differentiation from the world that nobody could pass them as fundamentally cured. To my way of thinking, there are as much cured as not cured. I have had occasion to follow up the lives of such patients, and it must be owned that many of them showed symptoms of maladjustment which, if persisted in, gradually leads to the sterility and monotony so characteristic of those who have divested themselves of their egos. Here, too, I am speaking of the borderline cases, and not of the less valuable, normal, average folk for whom the question of adaptation is more technical than problematic. If I were more of a therapist than an investigator, I would naturally be unable to check a certain optimism of judgment, because my eyes would then be glued to the number of cures. But my conscience, as 
an investigator is concerned not with quantity, but with quality. Nature is aristocratic, and one person of value outweighs ten lesser ones. My eye followed the valuable people, and from them I learned the dubiousness of the results of a purely personal analysis, and also to understand the reasons for this dubiousness. If, through assimilation of the unconscious, we make the mistake of including the collective psyche in the inventory of personal psychic functions, a dissolution of the personality into its paired opposites inevitably follows. Besides the pair of opposites already discussed, megalomania and the sense of inferiority, which are so painfully evident in neurosis, there are many others from which I will single out only the specifically moral pair of opposites, namely good and evil. The specific virtues and vices of humanity are contained in the collective psyche like everything else. One man arrogates collective virtue to himself as his personal merit. Another takes collective vice as his personal guilt. Both are as illusory as the megalomania and the inferiority, because the imagery, virtues, and the imagery, wickedness, are simply the moral pair of opposites contained in the collective psyche, which have become perceptible, or have been rendered conscious artificially. How much these paired opposites are contained in the collective psyche is exemplified by primitives. One observer will extol the greatest virtues in them, while another will record the very worst impressions of the self-same tribe. For the primitive, whose personal differentiation is, as we know, only just beginning, both judgments are true, because his psyche is essentially collective, and therefore, for the most part, unconscious. He is still more or less identical with the collective psyche, and for that reason shares equally in the collective virtues and vices, without any personal attribution and without inner contradiction. The contradiction arises only when the personal development of the psyche begins, and when reason discovers the irreconcilable nature of the opposites. The consequence of this discovery is the conflict of repression. We want to be good, and therefore must repress evil, and with that the paradise of the collective psyche comes to an end. Repression of the collective psyche was absolutely necessary for the development of personality. In primitives, development of personality, or more accurately, development of the person, is a question of magical prestige. The figure of the medicine man or chief leads the way. Both make themselves conspicuous by the singularity of their ornaments and their mode of life, expressive of their social roles. The singularity of his outward tokens marks the individual off from the rest, and the segregation is still further enhanced by the possession of special ritual secrets. By these and similar means, the primitive creates around him a shell which might be called a persona, mask. Masks, as we know, are actually used among primitives in totem ceremonies. For instance, as a means of enhancing or changing the personality. In this way, the outstanding individual is apparently removed from the sphere of the collective psyche, and to the degree that he succeeds in identifying himself with his persona, he actually is removed. This removal means magical prestige. One could easily assert that the impelling motive in this case, in this development, is the will to power, but that would be to forget that the building up of prestige is always a product of collective compromise. Not only must there be one who wants prestige, there must also be a public seeking somebody on whom to confer prestige. That being so, it would be incorrect to say that a man creates prestige for himself out of his individual will to power. It is, on the contrary, an entirely collective affair. Since society as a whole needs the magically effective figure, it uses this need of the will to power in the individual 
and the will to submit in the mass as a vehicle, and thus brings about the creation of personal prestige. The latter is a phenomenon which, as the history of political institutions shows, is of the utmost importance for the committee of nations. The importance of personal prestige can hardly be overestimated, because the possibility of regressive dissolution in the collective psyche is a very real danger, not only for the outstanding individual, but also for his followers. The possibility is most likely to occur when the goal of prestige, universal recognition, has been reached. The person then becomes a collective truth, and that is always the beginning of the end. To gain prestige is a positive achievement, not only for the outstanding individual, but also for the clan. The individual distinguishes himself by his deeds, the many by their renunciation of power. So long as this attitude needs to be fought for and defended against hostile influences, the achievement remains positive. But as soon as there are no more obstacles and universal recognition has been attained, prestige loses its positive value and usually becomes a dead letter. A schism schismatic movement then sets in and the whole process begins again from the beginning. Because personality is of such paramount importance for the life of the community, everything likely to disturb its development is sensed as a danger. But the greatest danger of all is the premature disillusion of prestige by an invasion of the collective psyche. Absolute secrecy is one of the best known primitive means of exercising this danger. Collective thinking and feeling and collective effort are far less of a strain than individual functioning and effort. Hence, there is always a great temptation to allow collective functioning to take the place of individual differentiation of the personality. Once the personality has been differentiated and safeguarded by magical prestige, its leveling down and eventual dissolution in the collective psyche, e.g. Peter's denial, occasion a loss of soul in the individual because an important personal achievement has been either neglected or allowed to slip into regression. For this reason, taboo infringements are followed by draconian punishments, altogether in keeping with the seriousness of the situation. So long as we regard these things from the causal point of view as mere historical survivals and metastases of the incest taboo, it is impossible to understand what all these measures are for. If, however, we approach the problem from the teleological point of view, much that was inexplicable becomes clear. For the development of personality, then, strict differentiation from the collective psyche is absolutely necessary, since partial or blurred differentiation leads to an immediate melting away of the individual in the collective. There is now a danger that in the analysis of the unconscious, the collective and the personal psyche may be fused together with, as I have intimated, highly unfortunate results. These results are injurious both to the patient's life feeling and to his fellow men if he has any influence at all on his environment. Through, through his identification with the collective psyche, he will infallibly try to force the demands of, the un, of his unconscious upon others, for identity with the collective psyche always brings with it a feeling of universal validity, godlikeness, which completely ignores all differences in the personal psyche of his fellows. The feeling of universal validity comes, of course, from the universality of the collective psyche. A collective attitude naturally presupposes the same collective psyche in others. But that means a ruthless disregard, not only of individual differences, but also of differences of a more general kind within the collective psyche itself. As, for example, differences of race. This disregard for individuality obviously means the suffocation of the single individual, as a consequence of which the element of differentiation is obliterated from the community. The element of differentiation is the individual. All the highest achievements of virtue, as well as the blackest villainies, are individual. 
the larger a community is, and the more the sum total of collective factors peculiar to every large community rests on conservative prejudices detrimental to individuality, the more will the individual be morally and spiritually crushed, and, as a result, the one source of moral and spiritual progress for society is choked up. Naturally, the only thing that can thrive in such an atmosphere is sociality and whatever is collective in the individual. Everything individual in him goes under, i.e. is doomed to repression. The individual elements lapse into the unconscious, where, by the law of necessity, they are transformed into something essentially baleful, destructive, and anarchical. Socially, this evil pr principle shows itself in the spectacular crimes, regicide and the like, perpetuated by certain prophetically inclined individuals, but in the great mass of the community it remains in the background and only manifests itself indirectly in the inexorable moral degeneration of society. It is a notorious fact that the, the morality of society as a whole is in inverse ratio to its size. For the greater the aggregation of individuals, the more the individual factors are blotted out, and with them, morality, which rests entirely on the moral sense of the individual and the freedom necessary for this. Hence, every man is, in a certain sense, unconsciously a worse man when he is in society than when acting alone, for he is carried by society and to that extent relieved of his individual responsibility. Any large company composed of wholly admirable persons has the morality and intelligence of an unwieldy, stupid, and violent animal. The bigger the organization, the more unavoidable is its immorality and blind stupidity. Senatus bestia, senatores boni viri. Society, by automatically stressing all the collective qualities in its individual represent representatives, puts a premium on medio mediocrity on everything that settles down to vegetate in an easy, irresponsible way. Individuality will inevitably be driven to the wall. This process begins in school, continues at the university, and rules all departments in which the state has a hand. In a small social body, the individuality of its members is better safeguarded, and the greater is their relative freedom and the possibility of conscious responsibility. Without freedom, there can be no morality. Our admiration for great organizations dwindles when, we, when once we become aware of the other side of the wonder, the tremendous piling up and accentuation of all that is primitive in man, and the unavoidable destruction of his individuality in the interests of the monstrosity that every great organization in fact is. The man of today, who resembles more or less the collective ideal, has made his heart into a den of murderers, as can easily be proved by the analysis of his unconscious, even though he himself is not in the least disturbed by it. And insofar as he is normally adapted to his environment, it is true that the greatest infamy on the part of his group will not disturb him so long as the majority of his fellows steadfastly believe in the exalted morality of their social organization. Now, all that I have said here about the influence of society upon the individual is identically true of the influence of the collective unconscious upon the individual psyche. But it, as is apparent from my examples, the latter influence is as invisible as the former is visible. Hence, it is not surprising that its inner effects are not understood, and those to whom such things happen are called pathological freaks and treated as crazy. If one of them happened to be a real genius, the fact would not be noted until the next generation or the one after. So obvious does it seem to us that a man should drown in his own dignity, so utterly incomprehensible that he should seek anything other than what the mob wants and that he should vanish permanently from view in this other. 
One could wish both of them a sense of humor that, according to Schopenhauer, truly divine attribute of man which alone befits him to maintain his soul in freedom. The collective instincts and fundamental forms of thinking and feeling whose activity is revealed by the analysis of the unconscious constitute, for the conscious personality, an acquisition which it cannot assimilate without considerable disturbance. It is, therefore, of the utmost importance in practical treatment to keep the integrity of the personality constantly in mind. For, if the collective psyche is taken to be the personal possession of the individual, it will result in a distortion or an overloading of the personality, which is very difficult to deal with. Hence, it is imperative to make a clear distinction between personal contents and those of the collective psyche. This distinction is far from easy because the personal grows out of the collective psyche and is intimately bound up with it. So it is difficult to say exactly what contents are to be called personal and what collective. There is no doubt, for instance, that archaic symbolisms such as we frequently find in fantasies and dreams are collective factors. All basic instincts and basic forms of thinking and feeling are collective. Everything that all men agree in regarding as universal is collective. Likewise, everything that is universally understood, universally found, universally said and done. On closer examination, one is always astonished to see how much of our so-called individual psychology is really collective. So much, indeed, that the individual traits are common are completely overshadowed by it. Since, however, individuation is an electable psychological necessity, we can see from the ascendancy of the collective what very special attention must be paid to this delicate plant, individuality, if it is not to be completely smothered. Human beings have one faculty which, though it is of the greatest utility, for collective purposes, is most pernicious for individuation, and that is the faculty of imitation. Collective psychology cannot dispense with imitation, for without it all mass organizations, the state and the social order are impossible. Society is organized, indeed, less by law than by the propensity of imitation, implying equally suggestibility, suggestion, and mental contagion. But we see every day how people use, or rather abuse, the mechanism of imitation for the purpose of personal differentiation. They are content to ape some eminent personality, some striking characteristic or mode of behavior, thereby achieving an outward distinction from the circle in which they move. We could almost say that as a punishment for this, the uniformity of their minds with those of their neighbors, already real enough, is intensified into an unconscious, compulsive bondage to the environment. As a rule, these specious attempts at individual differentiation stiffen into a pose. The imitator remains at the same level as he always was, only several, several degrees more sterile than before. To find out what is truly individual in ourselves, profound reflection is needed, and suddenly we realize how uncommonly difficult the discovery of individuality is. 3. The Persona as a Segment of the Collective Psyche In this chapter we come to a problem which, if overlooked, is liable to cause the greatest confusion. It will be remembered that in the analysis of the personal unconscious, the first things to be added to consciousness are the personal contents, and I suggested that these contents, which have been repressed but are capable of becoming conscious, should be called the personal unconscious. I also showed that to annex the deeper layers of the unconscious, which I have called the collective unconscious, produces an enlargement of the personality leading to the state of inflation. This state is reached by simply continuing the analytical work, as in the case of the young woman discussed above, 
but continuing the analysis, we add to the personal consciousness certain fundamental, general, and impersonal characteristics of humanity, thereby bringing about the inflation I have just described, which might be regarded as one of the unpleasant consequences of becoming fully conscious. From this point of view, the conscious personality is a more or less arbitrary segment of the collective psyche. It consists in a sum of psychic facts that are felt to be personal. The attribute personal means pertaining exclusively to this particular person. A consciousness that is purely personal stresses its proprietary and original right to its contents with a certain anxiety, and in this way seeks to create a whole. But all those contents that refuse to fit into this whole are either overlooked and forgotten or repressed and denied. There is one way of educating oneself, but it is too arbitrary and too much of a violation. Far too much of our common humanity has to be sacrificed in the interests of an ideal image into which one tries to mold oneself. Hence these purely personal people are always very sensitive, for something may easily happen that will bring into consciousness an unwelcome portion of their real, individual character. This arbitrary segment of collective psyche, often fashioned with considerable pains, I have called the persona. The term persona is really a very appropriate expression for this, for originally it meant the mask once worn by actors to indicate the role they played. If we endeavor to draw a precise distinction between what psychic material should be considered personal and what impersonal, we soon find ourselves in the greatest dilemma. For, by definition, we have to say of the person, persona's contents that we have said of the impersonal co unconscious, namely that it is collective. It is only because the persona represents a more or less arbitrary and fortuitous segment of the collective psyche that we can make the mistake of regarding it in toto as something individual. It is, as its name implies, only a mask of the collective psyche, a mask that feigns individuality, making others and oneself believe that one is individual, whereas one is simply acting a role through which the collective psyche speaks. When we analyze the persona, we strip off the mask and discover that what seemed to be individual is at bottom collective. In other words, that the persona was only a mask of the collective psyche. Fundamentally, the persona is nothing real. It is a compromise between individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. He takes a name, earns a title, exercises a function. He is this or that. In a certain sense, all of this is real. Yet in relation to the essential individuality of the person concerned, it is only a secondary reality, a compromise f formation, in making which others have a sh greater share than he. The persona is a semblance, two-dimensional reality, to give it a nickname. It would be wrong to leave the matter as it stands, without at the same time recognizing that there is, after all, something individual in the peculiar choice and delineation of the persona, and that despite the exclusive identity of the ego consciousness, with the persona, the unconscious self, one's real individuality, is always present and makes itself felt indirectly if not directly. Although the ego consciousness is at first identical with the persona, that compromise role in which we parade before the community, yet the unconscious self can never be repressed to the point of extinction. Its influence is chiefly manifest in the special nature of the contrasting and compensating contents of the unconscious. The purely personal attitude of the conscious mind evokes reactions on the part of the unconscious, and these, together with personal repressions, contain the seeds of individual development and the guise of collective fantasies. Through the analysis of the personal unconscious, the conscious mind becomes suffused with collective material which brings with it the elements of individuality. 
I am well aware that this conclusion must be almost unintelligible to anyone not familiar with my views and technique, and particularly so to those who habitually regard the unconscious from the standpoint of Freudian theory. But if the reader will recall my example of the philo philosophy student, he can form a rough idea of what I mean. At the beginning of the treatment, the patient was quite unconscious of the fact that her relation to her father was a fixation, that she was therefore seeking a man like her father, whom she could then meet with her intellect. This in itself would not have been a mistake if her intellect had not had that peculiarly protesting character, such as is unfortunately often encountered in intellectual women. Such an intellect is always trying to point out mistakes in others. It is preeminently critical, with a disagreeable personal undertone, yet it always wants to be considered objective. This invariably makes a man bad-tempered, particularly if, as it so often happens, the criticism touches on some weak spot, which, in the interests of fruitful discussion, were better avoided. But far from wishing the discussion to be fruitful, it is the unfortunate peculiarity of this feminine intellect to seek out a man's weak spots, fasten on them, and exasperate him. This is not unusually this is not usually a conscious aim, but rather has the unconscious purpose of forcing a man into a superior position and thus making him an object of admiration. The man does not, as a rule, notice that he is having the role of the hero thrust upon him. He merely finds her taunts so odious that in future he will go a long way to avoid meeting the lady. In the end, the only man who can stand her is the one who gives in at the start and therefore has nothing wonderful about him. My patient naturally found much to reflect upon in all this, for she had no notion of the game she was playing. Moreover, she still had to gain insight into the regular romance that had in been enacted between her and her father ever since childhood. It would lead us too far to describe in detail how, from her earliest years, with unconscious sympathy, she had played upon the shadow side of her father, which her mother never saw, and how, far in advance of her years, she became her mother's rival. All this came to light in the analysis of the personal unconscious, since, if only for professional reasons, I could not allow myself to be irritated, I inevitably became the hero and father-lover. The transference too consisted at first of contents from the personal unconscious. My role as a hero was just a sham, and so, as it turned me into the merest phantom, she was able to play her traditional role of the supremely wise, very grown-up, all-understanding mother, daughter, beloved. An empty role, a persona behind which her real and authentic being, her individual self, lay hidden. Indeed, to the extent that she at first completely identified herself with her role, she was altogether unconscious of her real self. She was still in her nebulous, infantile world, and had not yet discovered the real world at all. But as, through progressive analysis, she became conscious of the nature of her transference, the dreams I spoke of in Chapter 1 began to materialize. They brought up bits of the collective unconscious, and that was the end of her infantile world and of all the heroics. She came to herself and to her own real potentialities. This is roughly the way things go in most cases, if the analysis is carried far enough. That the consciousness of her individuality should coincide exactly with the reactivation of an archaic god image is not just an isolated coincidence, but a very frequent occurrence, which in my view corresponds to an unconscious law. After this digression, let us turn back to our earlier reflections. Once the personal repressions are lifted, the individuality and the collective psyche begin to emerge in a coalescent state, thus releasing the hitherto repressed personal fantasies. The fantasies and dreams which now appear assume a somewhat different aspect, an infallible sign of collective images seems to be the appearance 
of the cosmic element, i.e. the images in the dream or fantasy are connected with cosmic qualities, such as temporal and spatial infinity, enormous speed and extensions of movement. Astrological associations, telluric, lunar, and solar analogies, changes in the proportions of the body, etc. The obvious occurrence of mythological and religious motifs in a dream also points to the activity of the collective unconscious. The collective element is very often announced by peculiar symptoms, as for example by dreams where the dreamer is flying through space on a comet, or feels that he is the earth, or the sun, or a star, or else is of immense size, or dwarfishly small, or that he is dead, is in a strange place, is a stranger to himself, confused, mad, etc. Similarly, feelings of disorientation, of dizziness, and the like, may appear along with symptoms of inflation. The forces that burnt out of the collective psyche have a confusing and blinding effect. One result of, of the dissolution of the persona is a release of involuntary fantasy, which is apparently nothing else than the specific activity of the collective psyche. This activity throws up contents whose existence one had never suspected before. But as the influence of the collective unconscious increases, so the conscious mind loses its power of leadership. Imperceptibly it becomes the lead, while an unconscious and impersonal process gradually takes control. Thus, without noticing it, the conscious personality is pushed about like a figure on a chessboard by an invisible player. It is this player who decides the game of fate, not the conscious mind and its plans. This is how the resolution of the transference, apparently so impossible to the conscious mind, was brought about in my earlier example. The plunge into this process becomes unavoidable whenever the necessity arises of overcoming an apparently insuperable difficulty. It goes without saying that this necessity does not occur in every case of neurosis, since perhaps in the majority the prime consideration is only the removal of temporary difficulties of adaptation. Certainly severe cases cannot be cured without a far-reaching change of character or of attitude, in by far the greatest number. Adaptation to external reality demands so much work that inner adaptation to the collective unconscious cannot be considered for a very long time. But when this inner adaptation becomes a problem, a strange irresistible attraction proceeds from the unconscious and exerts a powerful influence on the conscious direction of life. The predominance of unconscious influences, together with the associated, associated disintegration of the persona and the deposition of the conscious mind from power, constitute a state of psychic disequilibrium, which, in analytical treatment, is artificially induced for the therapeutic purpose of resolving a difficulty that might block further development. There are, of course, innumerable obstacles that can be overcome with good advice and a little moral support, aided by goodwill and understanding on the part of the patient. Excellent curative results can be obtained in this way. Cases are not uncommon where there is no need to breathe a word about the unconscious. But again, there are difficulties for which one can foresee no satisfactory solution. If, in these cases, the psychic equilibrium is not already disturbed before treatment begins, it will certainly be upset during the analysis, and sometimes without any interference by the doctor. It often seems as though these patients had only been waiting to find a trustworthy person in order to give up and collapse. Such a loss of balance is similar in principle to a psychotic disturbance. That is, it differs from the initial stages of mental illness only by the fact that it leads in the end to greater health, while the latter leads to yet greater destruction. It is a condition of panic, a letting go in face of apparently hopeless complications. Mostly it was preceded by desperate efforts to master the difficulty by force of will. Then came the collapse, and the once guiding will crumbles completely. 
The energy, thus freed, disappears from consciousness and falls into the unconscious. As a matter of fact, it is at these moments that the first signs of unconscious activity appear. I am thinking of the example of that young man who was weak in the head. Obviously, the energy that fell away from consciousness has activated the unconscious. The immediate result is a change of attitude. One can easily imagine a stronger head, which would have taken that vision of the stars as a healing apparition, and would have looked upon human suffering sub specie aeternitatis, in which case his senses would have been restored. Had this happened, an apparently insurmountable obstacle would have been removed. Hence, I regard the loss of balance as purposive, since it replaces a defective consciousness by the automatic and instinctive activity of the uncon unconscious, which is aiming all the time at the creation of a new balance and will moreover achieve this aim, provided that the conscious mind is capable of assimilating the contents produced by the unconscious, i.e. of understanding and digesting them. If the unconscious simply rides roughshod over the conscious mind, a psychotic condition developments, uh, develops. If it can neither completely prevail nor yet be understood, the result is a conflict that cripples all further advance. But with this question, namely the understanding of the collective unconscious, we come to a formidable difficulty which I have made the theme of my next chapter. 4. Negative attempts to free the individuality from the collective psyche. A. Regressive restoration of the persona. A collapse of the conscious attitude is no small matter. It always feels like the end of the world, as though everything had tumbled back into original chaos. One feels delivered up, disoriented, like a rudderless ship that is abandoned to the moods of the elements. So at least it seems. In reality, however, one has fallen back up upon the collective unconscious, which now takes over the leadership. We could multiply examples of cases where, at the critical moment, a saving thought, a vision, an inner voice, came with an irresistible power of conviction and gave life a new direction. Probably we could mention just as many cases where the collapse meant a catastrophe that destroyed life. For at such moments, morbid ideas are also liable to take root, or ideals wither away, which is no less disastrous. In the one case, some psychic oddity develops, or a psychosis. In the other, a state of disorientation and demoralization. But once the unconscious contents break through into consciousness, filming it with their uncanny power of conviction, the question arises of how the individual will react. Will he be overpowered by these contents? Will he credulously accept them, or will he reject them? I am disregarding the ideal reaction, namely critical understanding. The first case signifies paranoia or schizophrenia. The second may either become an eccentric with a taste for prophecy or he may revert to an infantile attitude and be cut off from the human society the third signifies the regressive restoration of the persona this formulation sounds very technical and the reader may justifiably suppose that it has something to do with a complicated psychic reaction such as can be observed in the course of analytical treatment it would, however, be a mistake to think that cases of this kind make their appearance only in analytical treatment. The process can be observed just as well, and often better, in other situations of life, namely in all those careers where there has been some violent and destructive intervention of fate. Everyone, presumably, has suffered adverse turns of fortune, but mostly they are wounds that heal and leave no crippling mark. But here we are concerned with experiences that are destructive, that can smash a man completely or at least cripple him for good. Let us take as an example a businessman who takes too great a risk and consequently becomes bankrupt. If he does not allow himself to be discouraged by this depressing experience but, dis but undismayed keeps his former daring, perhaps with a little 
salutary caution added his wound will be healed without permanent injury but if on the other hand he goes to pieces abjures all further risks and laboriously tries to patch up his social reputation within the confines of a much more limited personality doing inferior work with the mentality of a scared child in a post far below him then technically speaking he will have restored his persona in a regressive way he will as a result of his fright have slipped back to an earlier phase of his personality he will have demeaned himself pretended that he is as he was before the crucial experience though utterly unable even to think of repeating such a risk formerly perhaps he wanted more than he could accomplish now he does not even dare to attempt what he has in him to do such experiences occur in every walk of life and in every possible form hence in physiological treatment also here again it is a question of widening the personality of taking a risk on one's circumstance or on one's nature what the critical experience is in actual treatment can be see, seen from the case of our philosophy student it is the transference as i have already indicated it is possible for the patient to slip over the reef of the transference unconsciously in which case it does not become an experience and nothing fundamental happens the doctor for the sake of mere convenience might well wish for such patients but if they are intelligent the patients soon discover the existence of this problem for themselves if then the doctor as in the case above is exalted into the father lover and the consequently has a flood of demands let loose against him he must perforce think out ways and means of parrying the onslaught without himself getting drawn into the maelstrom and without injury to the patient a violent rupture of the transference may bring on a complete relapse or worse so the problem must be handled with great tact and foresight another possibility is the pious hope that in time the nonsense will stop of its own accord certainly everything stops in time but it may be an unconscionably long time and the difficulties may be so unbearable for both sides that one might as well give up the idea of time as a healing factor at once a far better instrument for combating the transference would seem to be offered by the freudian theory of neurosis the dependence of the patient is explained as an infantile sexual demand that takes the place of a rational application of sexuality similar advantages are offered by the adlerian theory which explains the transference as an infantile power aim and as a security measure both theories fit the neurotic mentality so neatly that every case of neurosis can be explained by both theories at once this highly remarkable fact which any unprejudiced un observer is bound to corroborate can only rest on the circumstance that freud's infantile eroticism and adler's power drive are one and the same thing regardless of the clash of opinions between the two schools it is simply a fragment of uncontrolled and at first uncontrollable primordial instinct that comes to light in the phenomenon of transference the archaic fantasy forms that gradually reach the surface of consciousness are only a further proof of this we can try both theories to make the patient see how infantile impossible and absurd his demands are and perhaps in the end he will actually come to his senses again my patient however was not the only one who did not do this true enough the doctor can always save his face with these theories and extricate himself from a painful situation more or less humanely there are indeed patients with whom it is or seems to be unrewarding to go to greater lengths but there are also cases where these procedures cause senseless psychic injury 
In the case of my student, I dimly felt something of the sort, and I therefore abandoned my rationalistic attempts in order, with ill-concealed mistrust, to give nature a chance to cor correct what seemed to me to be her own foolishness. As already mentioned, this taught me something extraordinarily important, namely the existence of an unconscious self-regulation. Not only can the unconscious wish, it can also cancel its own wishes. This realization of such immense importance for the integrity of the personality must remain sealed to anyone who cannot get over the idea that it is simply a question of infantilism. He will turn round on the threshold of this realization and tell himself, It was all nonsense, of course. I am a cra crazy visionary. The best thing to do would be to bury the unconscious or throw it overboard with all its works. The meaning and purpose he has so eagerly desired, he will... The meaning and purpose he so eagerly desired, he will see only as infantile maunderings. He will understand that his longing was absurd. He learns to be tolerant with himself, resigned. What can he do? Rather than face the conflict, he will turn back and, as best he can, regressively restore his shattered persona, discounting all those hopes and expectations that had blossomed under the transference. He will become smaller, more limited, more rationalistic than he was before. One could not say that this result would be an unqualified misfortune in all cases, for there are, are all too many who, on account of their notorious ineptitude, thrive better in a rationalistic system than in freedom. Freedom is one of the more difficult things. Those who can stomach this way out can say with Faust, this earthly circle I know well enough. Towards the beyond, the view has been cut off. Fool, who directs the, that way his dazzled eye, contrives himself a double in the sky. Let him look round him here, not stray beyond. To a sound man, this world must needs respond. To roam into eternity is vain. What he perceives he can attain. Thus let him walk along his earth-long day. Though phantoms haunt him, let him go his way. Such a solution would be perfect if a man were really able to shake off the unconscious, drain it of its energy, and render it inactive. But experience shows that the unconscious can be deprived of its energy only in part. It remains continually active for it not only contains, but is itself the source of the libido, from which the psychic elements flow. It is, therefore, a delusion to think that by some kind of magical theory or method, the unconscious can finally be emptied of libido, and thus, as it were, eliminated. One may, for a while, play with this delusion, but the day comes when one is forced to say with Faust, but now such specterdom so throngs the air that none knows how to dodge it, none knows where. Though one day greet us with a rational gleam, the night entangles, entangles us in webs of dream. We come back happy from the fields of spring, and a bird croaks, croaks what? Some evil thing. Enmeshed in superstition, night and morn, it forms and shows itself and comes to warn. And if, and we, so scared, stand without friend or kin, and the door creaks and nobody comes in. Nobody, of his own free will, can strip the unconscious of its effective power. At best, one can merely deceive oneself on this point, for as Goethe says, Unheard by the outward ear, in the heart I whisper fear. Changing shape from hour to hour, I employ my savage power. Only one thing is effective against the unconscious, and that is hard outer necessity. Those with rather more knowledge of the unconscious 
will see behind the outer necessity the same face which once gazed at them from within. An inner necessity can change into an outer one, and so long as the outer necessity is real, and not just faked, psychic problems remain more or less ineffective. This is why Mephisto offers Faust, who is sick of the madness of magic, the following advice. Right, there is no one way that needs, no money, no physician, and no witch. Pack up your things and get back to the land, and there begin to dig and ditch. Keep to the narrow road, confine your mind, and live on fodder of the simplest kind. A beast among the beasts, and don't forget to use your own dung on the crops you set. It is a well-known fact that the simple life cannot be faked, and therefore the unproblematical existence of a poor man, who really is delivered over to fate, cannot be brought, bought by such cheap imitations. Only the man who lives such a life, not as a mere possibility, but is actually driven to it by the necessity of his own nature, will blindly pass over the problem of his soul, since he lacks the capacity to grasp it. But once he has seen the Faustian problem, the escape into the simpler life is closed forever. There is, of course, nothing to stop him from taking a two-room cottage in the country, or from pottering about in a garden and eating raw turnips. But his soul laughs at the deception. Only what is really oneself has the power to heal, the regressive restoration of the persona is a possible course only for the man who own, owes the critical failure of his life to his own inflatedness. With diminished personality, he turns back to the measure he can fill, but in every other case, resignation and self-belittlement are an evasion, which in the long run can be kept up only at the cost of neurotic sickliness. From the conscious point of view of the persona concerned, his condition does not look like an evasion at all, but seems to be due to the impossibility of coping with the problem. Usually he is a lonely figure, with little or nothing to help him in our present-day culture. Even psychology has only purely reductive interpretations to offer, since it inevitably underlines the archaic and the infantile character of the these transitional states and makes them unacceptable to him. The fact that a medical theory may also serve the purpose of enabling the doctor to pull his own head more or less elegantly out of the noose does not occur to him. This is precisely why these reductive theories fit the essence of neurosis so beautifully, since they are of such great service to the doctor. B. Identification with the collective psyche. The second way leads to identification with the collective psyche. This would amount to an acceptance of inflation, but now exalted into a system. That is to say, one would be the fortunate possessor of the great truth, which was only waiting to be discovered, of the eschatological knowledge which spells the healing of the nations. This attitude is not necessarily megalomania in direct form, but in the milder and more familiar form of prophetic inspiration and desire for martyrdom. For weak-minded persons, who as often as not possess more than their fair share of ambition, vanity, and misplaced naivety, the danger of yielding to this temptation is very great. Access to the collective psyche means a renewal of life for the individual, no matter whether the renewal is felt as pleasant or unpleasant. Everybody would like to hold fast to this renewal, one man because it enhances his life feeling, another because it promises a rich harvest of knowledge, a third because he has discovered the key that will transform his whole life. Therefore, all those who do not wish to deprive themselves of the great treasures that lie buried in the collective psyche 
will strive by every means possible to maintain their newly won connection with the primal source of life. Identification would seem to be the shortest road to this, for the dissolution of the persona in the collective psyche positively invites one to wed oneself with the ab abyss and blot out all memory in its embrace. This piece of mysticism is innate in all better men as the longing for the mother, the nostalgia for the source from which we came. As I have shown in my book on libido, Symbols of Transformation, Collected Works, Volume 5, there lie at the root of the regressive longing which Freud conceives as infantile fixation or the incest wish, a specific value and a specific need which are made explicit in myths. It is precisely the strongest and best among men, the heroes who give way to their regressive longing and purposely expose themselves to the danger of being devoured by the monster of the maternal abyss. But if a man is a hero, he is a hero because, in the final reckoning, he did not let the monster devour him, but subdued it, not once but many times. Victory over the collective psyche alone yields the true value, the capture of the horde, the invincible weapon, the magic talisman, or whatever it be that the myth deems most desirable. Anyone who identifies with the collective psyche, or in mythological terms, lets himself be devoured by the monster, and vanishes in it, attains the treasure that the dragon guards, but he does so in spite of himself, and to his own greatest harm. Probably no one who was conscious of the absurdity of this identification would have the courage to make a principle of it. But the danger is that very many people lack the necessary humor or else it fails them at this particular juncture. They are seized by a sort of pathos. Everything seems pregnant with meaning, and all effective self-criticism is checked. I would not deny, in general, the existence of genuine prophets, but in the name of caution, I would begin by doubting each individual case, for it is far too serious a matter for us lightly to accept a man as a genuine prophet. Every respectable prophet strives manfully against the unconscious pretensions of his role. When, therefore, a prophet appears at a moment's notice, we would be better advised to con contemplate a possible psychic disequilibrium. But besides the possibility of becoming a prophet, there is another alluring joy, subtler and apparently more legitimate the joy of becoming a prophet's disciple. This, for the vast majority of people, is an altogether ideal technique. Its advantages are the odium dignitatis, the superhuman responsibility of the prophet, turns into the so much sweeter otium indignitatis. The disciple is unworthy, modestly, he sits at the master's feet and guards against having ideas of his own. Mental laziness becomes a virtue. One can at least bask in the sun of a semi-divine being. He can enjoy, enjoy the archaism and infantilism of his unconscious fantasies without loss to himself, for all responsibility is laid at the master's door. Through his deification of the master, the disciple, apparently without noticing it, waxes in stature. Moreover, does he not possess the great truth, not his own discovery, of course, but received straight from the master's hands? Naturally, the disciples always stick together, not out of love, but for the very understandable purpose of an effortlessly confirming their own convictions by engendering an air of collective agreement. Now this is an identification with the collective psyche that seems altogether more commendable. Somebody else has the honor of being a prophet, but also the dangerous responsibility. For one's own part, one is a mere disciple, but nonetheless a joint guardian of the great treasure which the master has found. 
one feels the full dignity and burden of such a position, deeming it a solemn duty and a moral necessity to revile others not of a like mind, to enroll proselytes, to hold up a light to the Gentiles, exactly as though one were the prophet oneself. And these people, who creep about behind an apparently modest persona, are the very ones who, when inflated by identification with the collective psyche, suddenly burst upon the world scene. For just as the prophet is a primordial image from the collective psyche, so also is the disciple of the prophet. In both cases, inflation is brought about by the collective unconscious, but the independence of the individuality suffers injury. But since by no means all individualities have the strength to be independent, the disciple fantasy is perhaps the best they can accomplish. The gratifications of the accompanying inflation at least do something to make up for the loss of spiritual freedom. Nor should we underestimate the fact that the life of a real or imagined prophet is full of sorrows, disappointments, and privations, so that the Hosanna shouting band of disciples has the value of a compensation. All this is so humanely understandable that it would be a matter of a for astonishment if it led to any further destination whatever part two individuation one the function of the unconscious there is a destination a possible goal beyond the alternative stages dealt with in our last chapter that is the way of individuation individuation means becoming an individual and in so far as individuality embraces our innermost, last, and incomparable uniqueness, it also implies becoming one's own self. We could therefore translate individuation as coming to selfhood and self-realization. The possibilities of development discussed in the preceding chapters were, at bottom, alienations of the self, ways of divesting the self of its reality in favor of an external role or in favor of an imagined meaning. In the former case, the self retires into the background and also gives to social recognition, in the latter to the auto-suggestive meaning of a primordial image. In both cases, the collective has the upper hand. Self-alienation in favor of the collective corresponds to a social ideal. It even passes for social duty and virtue, although it can also be misused for egotistical purposes. Egoists are called selfish, but this naturally has nothing to do with the concept of self, as I am using it here. On the other hand, self-realization seems to stand in opposition to self-alienation. This misunderstanding is quite general, because we do not sufficiently distinguish between individualism and individuation. Individualism means deliberately stressing and giving prominence to some supposed peculiarity rather than to collective considerations and obligations. But individuation means precisely the better and more complete fulfillment of the collective qualities of the human being, since adequate consideration of the peculiarity of the individual is more conducive to a better social performance than when the peculiarity is neglected or suppressed. The idiosyncrasy of an individual is not to be understood as any strangeness in his substance or in his components, but rather as a unique combination or a gradual differentiation of functions and faculties which in themselves are universal. Every human face has a nose, two eyes, etc., but these universal factors are variable, and it is this variability which makes individual peculiarities possible. Individuation, therefore, can only means, mean a process of psychological development that fulfills the individual qualities given. In other words, it is a process by which a man becomes the, de the definite, unique being he is, he in fact is, and doing in so doing, he 
does not become selfish in the ordinary sense of the word, but is merely fulfilling the peculiarity of his nature. And this, as we have said, is vastly different from egotism or individualism. Now, in so far as the human individual, as a living unit, is composed of purely universal factors, he is wholly collective and therefore in no sense opposed to collectivity. Hence, the individualistic emphasis on one's own peculiarity is a contradiction of this basic fact of the living being. Individuation, on the other hand, aims as a living cooperation of all factors. But since the universal factors always appear only in individual form, a full consideration of them will also produce an individual effect, and one which cannot be surpassed by anything else, least of all by individualism. The aim of individuation is nothing less than to divest the self of the false wrappings of the persona on the one hand, and of the suggestive power of primordial images on the other. From, from what has been said in the previous chapters, it should be sufficiently clear what the persona means psychologically. But when we turn to the other side, namely to influence of the collective unconscious, we find we are moving in a dark interior world that is vastly more difficult to understand than the psychology of the persona, which is accessible to everyone. Everyone knows what is meant by putting on official airs or playing a social role. Through the persona, a man tries to appear as this or that, or he hides behind a mask, or he may even build up a definite persona as a barricade. So the problem of the persona should present no great intellectual difficulties. It is, however, another thing to describe in a way that can generally be understood. Those subtle inner processes which invade the conscious mind with such suggestive force. Perhaps we can best portray these influences with the help of examples of mental illness, creative inspiration, and religious conversion. A most excellent account, taken from life, so to speak, of such an inner transformation can be found in H.G. Wells' Christina Alberta's Father. Changes of a similar kind are described in Leon Daudet, eminently readable Le Heredo. A wide range of material is contained in William James's Varieties of Religious Experience. Although in many cases of this kind, there are certain external factors which either directly condition the change or at least provide the occasion for it. Yet it is not always the case that the external factors factor offers a sufficient explanation of these changes of personality. We must recognize the fact that they can also arise from subjective inner causes, opinions, convictions, where external stimuli play no part at all, or a very insignificant one. In pathological changes of personality, this can even be said to be the rule. The case, cases of psychosis that present a clear and simple reaction to some overwhelming outside event belong to the exceptions. Hence, for psychiatry, the essential etiological factor is the inherited or acquired pathological disposition. The same is probably true of the most creative intuitions, for we are hardly likely to suppose a purely causal connection between the falling apple and Newton's theory of gravitation. Similarly, all religious conversions that cannot be traced back directly to suggestion and contagious example rest upon independent interior processes, culminating in a change of personality. As a rule, these processes have the peculiarity of being subliminal, i.e. unconscious, in the first place and of reaching consciousness only gradually. The moment of eruption can, however, be very sudden, so that consciousness is instantaneously flooded with extremely strange and apparently quite unsuspected contents. That is how it looks to the layman, and even to the person concerned. But the experience 
observer knows that psychological events are never sudden. In reality, the eruption has been preparing for many years, often for half a lifetime, and already in childhood. All sorts of remarkable signs could have been detected, which, in more or less symbolic fashion, hinted at abnormal future developments. I am reminded, for instance, of a mental case who refused all nourishment and created quite extraordinary difficulties in connecting with nasal feeding. In fact, an anesthetic was necessary before the tube could be inserted. The patient was able in some remarkable way to swallow his tongue by pressing it back into the throat, a fact that was quite new and unknown to me at the time. In a lucid interval, I obtained the following history from the man. As a boy, he had often revolved in his mind the idea of how he could take his life, even if every conceivable measure were employed to prevent him. He first tried to do it by holding his breath until he found that by the time he was in a semi-conscious state, he had already begun to breathe again. So he gave up these attempts and thought, perhaps it would work if he refused food. This fantasy satisfied him until he discovered that food could be poured into him through the nasal cavity. He therefore considered how this entrance might be closed, and thus it was that he hit upon the idea of pressing his tongue backwards. At first he was unsuccessful, and so he began a regular training, until at last he succeeded in swallowing his tongue in much the same way as sometimes happens accidentally during anesthesia. Evidently, in his case, by artificially relaxing the muscles at the root of the tongue. In this strange manner, the boy paved the way for his future psychosis. After the second attack, he became incurably insane. This is only one example among many others, but it suffices to show how the subsequent, apparently sudden eruption of alien contents is really not sudden at all but it's rather the result of an unconscious development that has been going on for years. The great question now is, in what do these unconscious processes consist? And what and how are they constituted? Naturally, as long as they are unconscious, nothing can be said about them. But sometimes they manifest themselves, partly through symptoms, partly through actions, opinions, affects, fantasies, and dreams. Aided by such observational material, we can draw indirect conclusions as to the momentary state and constitution of the unconscious process and their development. We should not, however, labor under the illusion that we have now discovered the real nature of the unconscious processes. We never succeeded in getting further than the hypothetical as if. No mortal mind can plumb the depths of nature, nor even the depths of the unconscious. We do know, however, that the unconscious never rests. It seems to be always at work, for even when asleep we dream. There are many people who declare that they never dream, but the probability is that they simply do not remember their dreams. It is significant that people who talk in their sleep mostly have no recollection either of the dream which started them talking or even of the fact that they dreamed at all. Not a day passes where we make some slip of the tongue or something slips out of our memory which at other times we know perfectly well or we are seized by a mood which cause, whose cause we cannot trace, etc. These things are all symptoms of some consistent unconscious activity which becomes directly visible at night and dreams, but only occasionally breaks through the inhibitions imposed by our daytime consciousness. So far as our present experience goes, we can lay it down that the unconscious processes stand in a comp compensatory relation to the conscious mind. I expre expressly use the word compensatory and not the word contrary because conscious and the unconscious are not necessarily in opposition to one another, but complement one another to form a totality, which is the self. According to this definition, the self is a quantity that is supraordinate to the conscious ego, 
It embraces not only the conscious, but also the unconscious psyche, and is therefore, so to speak, a personality which we also are. It is easy enough to think of ourselves as possessing part souls. Thus we can, for instance, see ourselves as a persona without too much difficulty. But it transcends our powers of imagination to form a clear picture of what we are as a self, for in this operation the part which would have to comprehend the whole. There is little hope of our ever being able to reach even approximate consciousness of the self. Since, however, much we make conscious, there will always exist an indeterminate and indeterminable amount of unconscious material which belongs to the totality of the self. Hence, the self will always remain in a supraordinate quantity. The unconscious processes that compensate the conscious ego contain all the, those elements that are necessary for the self-regulation of the psyche as a whole. On the personal level, there are the not consciously recognized personal motives which appear in dreams, or the meanings of daily situations which we have overlooked, or conclusions we have failed to draw, or affects we have not permitted, or criticisms we have spared ourselves. But the more we become conscious of ourselves through self-knowledge, and act accordingly, the more the layer of the personal unconscious that is superimposed on the collective unconscious will be diminished. In this way, there arises a consciousness which is no longer imprisoned in the petty, oversensitive, personal world of the ego, but participates freely in the wider world of objective interests. This widened consciousness is no longer that touchy, egotistical bundle of personal wishes, fears, hopes, and ambitions, which always has to be compensated or corrected by unconscious counter-tendencies. Instead, it is a function of relationship to the world of objects, bringing the individual into absolute, binding, indissoluble communion with the world at large. The complications arising at this stage are no longer egotistic wish conflicts, but difficulties that concern others as much as oneself. At this stage, it is fundamentally a question of collective problems, which have activated the collective unconscious because they require collective rather than personal compensation. We can now see that the, that the unconscious produces contents which are valid not only for the person concerned, but for others as well, in fact for a great many people, and possibly for all. The Elgonyi, natives of the Elgon forest of Central Africa, explained to me that there are two kinds of dreams. The ordinary dream of the little man, and the big version, the big vision, that only the great man has, e.g. the medicine man, or chief. Little dreams are of no account. But if a man has a big dream, he summons the whole tribe in order to tell it to everybody. How is a man to know whether his dream is a big or a little one? He knows it by an instinctive feeling of significance. He feels so overwhelmed by the impression it makes that he would, not, he would never think of keeping the dream to himself. He has to tell it on the psychologically corrupt, correct assumption that it is of general significance. Even with us, the collective dream has a feeling of importance about it that impels communication. It springs from a conflict of relationship and must therefore be built into our conscious relations, because it compensates these and not just some inner personal quirk. The processes of the collective unconscious are concerned not only with the more or less personal relations of an individual to his family or to an, a wider social group, but with his relations to society and to the human community in general. The more general and impersonal the condition that releases the unconscious reaction, the more significant, bizarre, and overwhelming will be the compensatory manifestation. It impels not just private communication, 
but drives people to revelations and confessions, and even to a dramatic representation of their fantasies. I will explain by an example how the unconscious manages to compensate relationships. A somewhat arrogant gentleman once came to me for treatment. He ran a business in partnership with his younger brother. Relations began in, between the two brothers were very strained, and this was one of the essential causes of my patient's neurosis. From the information he gave me, the real reason for the tension was not altogether clear. He had all kinds of criticisms to make of his brother, whose gifts he certainly did not show in a very favorable light. The brother frequently came into his dreams, always in the role of a Bismarck, Napoleon, or Julius Caesar. His house looked like the Vatican, or Yildiz kiosk. My patient's unconscious evidently had the need to exalt the rank of the younger brother. From this I concluded he was setting himself too high and his brother too low. The further course of analysis entirely justified this inference. Another patient, a young woman who clung to her mother in, ext in an extremely sentimental way, always had very sinister dreams about her. She appeared in the dreams as a witch, as a ghost, as a pursuing demon. The mother had spoilt her beyond all reason and had so blinded her by tenderness that the daughter had no conscious idea of her mother's harmful influence, hence the compensatory criticism exercised by the unconscious. I myself once happened to put too low a value on a patient, both intellectually and morally. In a dream I saw a castle perched on a high cliff, and on the topmost tower was a balcony, and there sat my patient. I did not hesitate to tell her this dream at once, naturally, with the best results. We all know how apt we are to make fools of ourselves in front of the very people we have unjustly underrated. Naturally, the case can also be reversed, as once happened to a friend of mine. Whilst still a callow student, he had written to Virchow, the pathologist, craving an audience with His Excellency. When, quaking with fear, he presented himself and tried to give his name, he blurted out, My name is Virchow, whereupon His Excellency, smiling mischievously, said, Ah, so your name is Virchow, too. The feeling of his own nullity was evidently too much for the unconscious of my friend, and in consequence, it instantly prompted him to present himself as equal to Virchow in grandeur. In these more personal relations, there is, of course, no need for any very collective compensations. On the other hand, the figures employed by the unconscious in our first case are of a definitely collective nature. There are universally recognized heroes. Here, there are two possible interpretations. Either my patient's younger brother is a man of acknowledged and far-reaching collective importance, or my patient is overestimating his own importance, not merely in relation to his brother, but in relation to everybody else as well. For the first assumption, there was no support at all, while for the second, there was the evidence of one's own eyes. Since the man's extreme arrogance affected not only himself, but a far wider social group, the compensation availed himself, availed itself of a collective image. The same is true of the second case. The witch is a collective image. Hence, we must conclude that the blind dependence of the young woman applied as much to the wider social group as it did to her mother personally. This was indeed the case, insofar as she was still living in an exclusively infantile world, where the world was identical with her parents. These examples deal with relations within the personal orbit. There are, however, impersonal relations which occasionally need unconscious compensation. In such cases, collective images appear with a more or less mythological character. Moral, philosophical, and religious problems are, on account of their universal validity, 
the most likely to call for mythological compensation. In the aforementioned novel by H.G. Wells, we find a classical type of comp compensation. Mr. Primby, a midget personality, discovers that he really he is really a reincarnation of Sargon, King of Kings. Happily, the genius of the author rescues poor old Sargon from pathological absurdity and even gives the reader a chance to appreciate the tragic and eternal meaning in this lamentable affray. Mr. Primby, a complete non-entity, recognizes himself as the point of intersection of all ages past and future. This knowledge is not too dearly brought at the cost of a little madness, provided that the Primby is not in the end devoured by that monster of a primordial image, which is in fact what nearly happens to him. The universal problem of evil and sin is another aspect of our impersonal relations to the world. Almost more than any other, therefore, this problem produces collective compensations. One of my patients, aged 16, had as the initial symptom of a severe compulsion, neurosis, the following dream. He is walking along an unfamiliar street. It is dark, and he hears steps coming behind him. With a feeling of fear, he quickens his pace. The footsteps come nearer, and his fear increases. He begins to run, but the footsteps seem to be overtaking him. Finally, he turns round, and there he sees the devil. In deathly terror, he leaps into the air and hangs there, suspended. This dream was repeated twice, a sign of its special urgency. It is a notorious fact that the compulsion neuroses, by reason of their meticulousness and ceremonial punctilio, not only have the surface appearances of a moral problem, but are indeed brimful of human, of inhuman beastliness and ruthless evil against the integration of which the very delicately organized personality puts up a desperate struggle this explains why so many things have to be performed in ceremonially correct style as though to counteract the evil hovering in the background after this dream the neurosis started and its essential feature was that the patient had as he put it to keep himself in a provisional or uncontaminated state of purity. For this purpose, he either severed or made invalid all contact with the world and with everything that reminded him of the transitoriness of human existence by means of lunatic formalities, scrupulous cleansing ceremonies, and the anxious observance of innumerable rules and regulations of an unbelievable complexity. Even before the patient had any suspicion of the hellish, hellish existence that lay before him, the dream showed him that if he wanted to come down to earth again, there would have to be a pact with evil. Elsewhere I have described a dream that illustrates the compensation of a religious problem in a young theological student. He was involved in all sorts of difficulties of belief, a not uncommon occurrence in a man of today. In his dream, he was the pupil of the white magician, who, however, was dressed in black. After having instructed him up to a certain point, the white magician told him that they now needed the black magician. The black magician appeared, but clad in a white robe. He declared that he had found the keys of paradise, but needed the wisdom of the white magician in order to understand how to use them. This dream obviously contains the problem of opposites, which, as we know, has found in Taoist philosophy a solution very different from the views prevailing in the West. The, figure, the figures employed by the dream are impersonal collective images corresponding to the nature of the impersonal religious problem. In contrast to the Christian view, the dream stresses the relativity of good and evil in a way that immediately calls to mind the Taoist symbol of yin and yang. We should certainly not conclude from these 
compensations that as the un as the conscious mind becomes more deeply engrossed in universal problems the unconscious will bring forth correspondingly far-reaching compensations there is what one might call a legitimate and an illegitimate interest in impersonal problems excursions of this kind are legitimate only when they arise from the deepest and truest needs of the individual illegitimate when they are either mere intellectual curios curiosity or a flight from unpleasant reality in the latter case the unconscious produces all too human and purely personal compensations whose manifest aim is to bring the conscious mind back to ordinary reality people who go illegitimately mooning after the infinite often have absurdly banal dreams which endeavor to damp down their ebullience thus from the nature of the compensation we can at once draw conclusions as to the seriousness and rightness of the conscious strivings there are certainly not a few people who are afraid to admit that the unconscious could never have big ideas they will object but do you really believe that the unconscious is capable of offering anything like constructive criticism of our western mentality of course if we take the problem intellectually and impute rational intentions to the unconscious the thing becomes absurd but it would never do to foist our conscious psychology upon the unconscious its mentality is an instinctive one it has no differentiated functions and it does not think as we understand thinking it simply creates an image that answers to the conscious situation this image contains as much thought as feeling and is anything rather than a product of rationalistic reflection such an object would be better described as an artist's vision we tend to forget that the problem that a problem like the one which underlies the dream last mentioned cannot even to the conscious mind of the dreamer be an intellectual problem but is profoundly emotional for a moral man the ethical problem is a passionate question which has its roots in the deepest instinctual processes as well as in his most idealistic aspirations the problem for him is devastatingly real it is not surprising therefore that the answer likewise springs from the depths of his nature the fact that everyone thinks his psychology is the measure of all things and if he also happens to be a fool will inevitably think that such a problem is beneath his notice should not trouble the psychologist in the least for he has to take things objectively as he finds them without twisting them to fit his subjective suppositions the richer and more capacious natures may legitimately be gripping be gripped by an impersonal problem and to the extent that this is so the unconscious can answer in the same style and just as the conscious mind can put the question why is there this frightful conflict between good and evil to the unconscious can reply look closer each needs the other the best just because it is the best holds the seed of evil and there is nothing so bad but good can come of it it might then dawn on the dreamer that the apparently insoluble conflict is perhaps a prejudice a frame of mind conditioned by time and place the seemingly complex dream image might itself reveal as plain instinctive common sense as the tiny germ of a rational idea which a mature mind could just as well have thought consciously at all events chinese philosophy thought of it ages ago the singularity apt plastic configuration of thought is the prerogative of the primitive natural spirit which is alive in all of us and is only obscured by a one-sided conscious development if we consider the unconscious compensations from this angle we might justifiably be accused of judging the con the unconscious too much from the conscious standpoint and indeed in pursuing these reflections i have always started from the view the unconscious simply reacts to the conscious contents 
albeit in a very significant way, but that it lacks initiative. It is, however, far from my intention to give the impression that the unconscious is merely reactive in all cases. On the contrary, there is a host of experiences which seem to prove that the unconscious is not only spontaneous, but can actually take the lead. There are innumerable cases of people who lingered on in a petty, fogging unconsciousness only to become neurotic in the end. Thanks to the neurosis contrived by the unconscious, they are shaken out of their apathy, and this in spite of their own laziness and often desperate resistance. Yet in, it would, in my view, be wrong to suppose that in such cases the unconscious is working to a deliberate and concerted plan and is striving to realize certain definite ends. I have found nothing to support this assumption, the driving force, so far as it is possible for us to grasp it seems to be in essence only an urge towards self-realization. If it were a matter of some general teleological plan, then all individuals who enjoy a surplus of unconsciousness would necessarily be driven towards higher consciousness by an irresistible urge. That is plainly not the case. There are vast masses of the population who, despite their notorious unconsciousness, never get anywhere near a neurosis. The few who are smitten by such a fate are really persons of the higher type who, for one reason or another, have remained too long on a primitive level. Their nature does not, in the long run, tolerate persistence in what is, for them, an unnatural torpor. As a result of their narrow conscious outlook and their cramped existence, they save energy, bit by bit, it accumulates in the unconscious and finally explodes in a form of a more or less acute neurosis. This simple mechanism does not necessarily conceal a plan. A perfectly understandable urge towards self-realization would provide a, a quite satisfactory explanation. We could also speak of a retarded maturation of the personality. Since it is highly probable that we are still a long way from the summit of absolute consciousness, presumably everybody is capable of wider consciousness and we may assume accordingly that the unconscious processes are constantly supplying us with contents which, if consciously recognized, would extend the range of consciousness. Looked at in this way, the unconscious appears as a field of experience of unlimited extent. If it were merely a reactive to the conscious mind, we might aptly call it a psychic mirror world. In that case, the real source of all contents and activities would lie in the conscious mind, and there would be absolutely nothing in the unconscious except the distorted reflections of conscious contents. The creative processes would be shut, down, shut up in the conscious mind, and anything new would be nothing but conscious invention or cleverness. The empirical facts give the lie to this. Every creative man knows that spontaneity is the very essence of creative thought, because the unconscious is not just a reactive mirror reflection, but an independent, productive activity. Its realm of experience is a self-contained world, having its own reality, of which we can only say that it affects us as we affect it, precisely what we say about our experience of the outer world. And just as material objects are the constituent elements of this world, so psychic factors constitute the objects of that other world. The idea of psychic objectivity is by no means a new discovery. It is, in fact, one of the earliest and most universal acquisitions of humanity. It is nothing less than the conviction as to the concrete existence of a spirit world, the spirit world was certainly never an invention in the sense that fire boring was an invention. It was far rather the experience, the conscious acceptance of a reality in no way inferior to that of the material world. I doubt whether primitives exist anywhere who are not acquainted with magical influence or a magical substance. Magical is simply another word for psychic. 
it would also appear that practically all primitives are aware of the existence of spirits. Spirit is a psychic fact. Just as we distinguish our own bodiliness from bodies that are strange to us, so primitives, if they have any notion of souls at all, distinguish between their own souls and the spirits, which are felt as strange and not and as not belonging. There are objects of outward perception, whereas their own soul, or one of several souls where a plurality is assumed, though believed to be essentially akin to the spirits, is not usually an object of so-called sensible perception. After death, the soul, or one of the plurality of souls, becomes a spirit which survives the dead man, and often it shows a marked deterioration of character that partly contradicts the notion of personal immortality. The b Bataks of Sumatra go so far as to assert that the people who were good in this life turn into malign and dangerous spirits. Nearly everything that the primitives say about the tricks which the spirits play on the living and the general picture they give of the revenants corresponds down to the last detail with the phenomenon phenomena established by spiritualistic experience and just as the communications from the beyond can be seen to be the activities of broken off bits of the psyche so these primitive spirits are manifestations of unconscious complexes the importance of that modern psychology attaches to the parental complex is a direct continuation of primitive man's experience of the dangerous power of the ancestral spirits even the error of a judgment which leads him unthinkingly to assume that the spirits are realities of the external world is carried on in our assumption which is only partially correct that the real parents are responsible for the par parental complex in the old trauma theory of Freudian psychoanalysis, and in other quarters as well, this assumption ought even passed for a scientific explanation. It was in order to avoid this confusion that I advocated the term parental imago. The simple soul is, of course, quite unaware of the fact that his nearest relations who exercise immediate influence over him created in him an image which is only partly a replica of themselves while its other part is compounded of elements derived from himself. The imago is built up of parental influences plus the specific reactions of the child. It is therefore an image that reflects the object with very considerable qualifications. Naturally, the simple soul believes that his parents are as he sees them. The image is unconsciously projected, and when the parents die, the projected image goes on working as though it were a spirit existing on its own. The primitive then speaks of parental spirits who return by night, revenants, while the modern man calls it a father or mother complex. The more limited a man's field of consciousness is, the more numerous the psychic contents, imagos, which meet him as quasi-external apparitions, either in the form of spirits or as magical potencies projected upon living people, magicians, witches, etc., at a higher, at a rather higher state of development where the idea of the soul already exists, not all the imagos continue to be projected. Where this happens, even trees and stones talk, but one or the other complex has come near enough to consciousness to be felt as no longer strange, but as somehow belonging. Nevertheless, the feeling that it belongs is not at first sufficiently strong for the complex to be sensed as a subjective content of consciousness. It remains in a sort of no man's land between conscious and the unconscious, in the half-shadow, in part belonging or akin to the conscious subject, in part an autonomous being, and meeting consciousness as such. In all events, it is not necessarily obedient to the subject's intentions, but it may even be of a higher order, 
more often than not a source of inspiration or warning or of supernatural information. Psychologically, such a content could be explained as a partly autonomous complex that is not yet fully integrated. The archaic souls, the Ba and the Ka of the Egyptians, are complexes of this kind. At a still higher level, and particularly among the civilized peoples of the West, this complex is invariably of the feminine gender, anima, a fact for which deeper and cogent reasons are not lacking. Thank you for listening. This is the end of the essay, Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious, by Carl Jung.